So what I'd like to do this evening is to uh, explore the intersection of three big topics, and they're aging, memory, and the idea of greedy algorithms. And so those are the uh, three things that I'm going to be trying to uh, weave together in tonight's uh, presentation. So what I'm particularly interested in doing is exploiting the information that's left behind either by designing a material or its manipulation, and I want to see how that would work. So uh, there's a, a quote that I like very much from uh, the uh, choreographer Twyla Tharp. Uh, she says, there are as many forms of memory as there are ways of perceiving, and every one of them is worth mining for inspiration. And so I, I think that's really nice, and it, you know, it, it kind of says what we should be all after is to mine things for, for inspiration. And I just want to point out a couple of memories to start off with here so that we kind of see what's, what's going on. And so the first one is simple and obvious. And so uh, here is uh, the, the simplest memory I can think of, and it's, uh, it's a ruler, right? And so uh, what this does is you, know, you put a mark at one end, you put a mark at the other end, and with this one ruler, you're able to measure things, and it's a memory. It's a memory built into the ruler. So that's the obvious and simple uh, kind of memory. There's other memories which are more subtle and uh, take a little bit of su surprise. And so I want to show one of those here. And so uh, this is a uh, memory that uh, uh, is it's a well-known uh, demonstration uh, of over many years, but uh, w we built this just so it could get through the airport security. So uh, um, it's got less than three ounces of fluid in here, so, so we're able to get it through. Uh, and what it is is in the center of this, there is a uh, big cylinder of uh, nylon, and outside there's this plastic that you can see through. And in between that, we filled it with liquid. Okay, and you can't see the liquid. I can twirl this around, right? And uh, you don't see much happening to the uh, uh, it, it, to anything in there because it's just uh, transparent liquid, and you just see the white thing, uh, uh, nylon uh, circulating. So what I want to do is I want to show you what's happening inside the fluid, and so I'm going to put a little bit of dye in here and see if we can't uh, get this dye in here. So, Okay, so that's supposed to be an S for Simons, what else? <laughs> uh, and so uh, we can see this, and so let's see. So you can all see that that's uh, everywhere here, so you can all see that it's on the screen as well. So for you. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, this fluid, and I'm going to mix it up, right? And so I'm just going to turn this around, and you know, clearly I've mixed this thing up, and you know, I've turned it around uh, quite a bit, and now I'm going to undo that, and it's mixed up. And so when you mix something up, it, it stays mixed. I mean, that's one of the great laws of physics. I, mean, I think it's a physics law. Well, let's see how how good physics works. And so I'm going to now turn this in the opposite direction. Whoops, I hope it works. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so uh, you don't know how, uh, how I suffered to, to, to get this <laughs> through here. But anyway, so I'm glad it works. Every, I've, I've performed this you know, hundreds of times now in front of people, and every time it comes back to that, and there's a pit in my stomach that says, it's not going to work this time. <laughs> but you know, it always does. And um, so what is the, the point of this as well? Uh, for the thing tonight is that I want to show you that, okay, even though it wasn't clear that it was there, there was a memory that this material had of how I had manipulated it in the past. And the question is, well, can I ma manipulate things in a way that then becomes useful in, in some uh, serious way? Well, so uh, th this is a, uh, I, I didn't want to get into this so, so much because that's not particularly the topic, that this is, uh, the liquid in here uh, is called glycerol. Uh, you may know of it because it's, uh, uh, you know, you put into, uh, you can buy it at a drugstore and you can put it in to make 
big, uh, you know, bubbles, uh, soap bubbles, uh, and make them bigger. Uh, but you also may know it because uh, I've been told, at least, that McDonald's puts it in their shakes <laughs> to give it that, you know, je ne sais quoi, the McDonald's. And so uh, that, that's what uh, uh, we, we have here. Okay. So it, it doesn't work with water with this apparatus, but if I had made it really, really, really thin, so the, there's a, a dimensionless number that I have to get small, and w water, is, uh, so I'd have to have the gaps a thousand times smaller, et cetera, to, to, in order to see it. But that's, uh, but any fluid that I'm in that limit with should have worked this way, okay? And so, uh, and glycerol just makes it visible for us. Okay, so that is two memories that I want, uh, want you to see. And so now, what I want to um, uh, talk about this evening are, is all based on ideas that have come from our collaboration. Uh, and so uh, uh, at the top row, I have some of our uh, PIs, Andrea Liu and Matthew Villar, and uh, some of our affiliates, Carolina Brito and uh, Srikant Sastri. And so th these are the people whose ideas have sp uh, spurred this kind of work that I'm going to be telling you about tonight. And then there were a bunch of students and postdocs here, and uh, th they're the ones who actually did all the work. And the ones that I have in, you know, outlined are the ones whose work I'm really going to be talking about tonight. So uh, Daniel Hexner is a postdoc with us. Jason Rocks is a graduate student uh, at University of Pennsylvania. Nidhi Pashini is uh, a, a graduate student in my group at Chicago. Okay, so uh, these are the people whose work I'm going to be ta talking about. And now about the talk, there are going to be three parts to the talk. The first part is uh, the missing half, and uh, it's about our disordered world and about the new laws that you get when you think about disorder. And uh, what I, the main purpose of this part is to say that, that disordered matter is different from crystalline solids. And so I want to show you that and, and sh show how that works. The second half of the talk is about malleability of disorder, and that there, because of the disorder, you get new design rules that allow you to make new kinds of things. And so that's the second half. The third half of the talk of, uh, is about directed aging. And so this is an idea where we want to get the materials to train themselves to have these properties. And so those are the three aspects that I'm going to be uh, going through. OK, so the first part is the missing half, our disordered world, and the new laws that come about. So what I want to emphasize at the beginning is that glasses are different from crystalline materials, from ordered materials. And you can see this by their structure. And so here in, in red at the top is uh, a disordered material, a glass, a jam system. And you can see the particles are not in any particular obvious order. On the right, I have a crystalline material where every atom is in a crystalline lattice. In a, uh, you know, it has all the symmetries of, of the lattice. Uh, below that, I have something that's perhaps more interesting is somehow the phase space in which these materials live. That is, the, the, uh, for a glass or a jam system, the landscape, potential energy, or free energy landscape, is very rough. And so there are many, many minima in such a landscape. Whereas for the crystal, you only have one very deep minimum. And so this creates a lot of opportunity. On the one hand, uh, these glasses are going to be more, uh, more adaptable. That is, you, because there are so many different minima, you can try to train it to be in one minimum versus another. And in the aspect of training, you can have multiple paths to go from one minimum to another. And so these are some of the um, uh, ways in which glasses could be useful. And so this flexibility, we want to harness this for novel behavior. <coughs> so how does this sort of matter compare to, uh, to a crystal? And so I show here just a, uh, you know, a schematic of a, a, of a disordered system. And it obviously is not a crystal. That is, it's not in a lattice. It has the structure that's more like what you would get from a liquid. But if it's you know, just the structure, I would claim that's kind of a boring aspect of the system. I mean, uh, I was told when I was a kid to look out the window, and that window pane in front of me 
was somehow supposed to be different from everything else around me, and I couldn't get it. I mean, I just didn't see. It was hard. I, I rapped on it, and it rapped back. I mean, you know, it, it, it didn't seem in any way different. And if, it, if all you had to do was go to an x-ray machine to see that the particles were not actually in an ordered array, well, so they're not in an ordered array. I mean, that doesn't tell you that much. The question is, is there other things about this being in a disordered array that makes this an exciting problem? And what I want to assure you is there is much, much more, and that's why we're excited about this. And I'm only going to tell you about two aspects of this tonight, because that's all I have time for. But one has to do with the elasticity of such a medium, a, a material that's glassy versus crystal. And the other is this idea of aging. And materials age over time. And you don't get that with a crystal, which is already in its equilibrium position. But glasses can age because they are searching for a better and better ground state. And they can do this over time. And so that's one of the things that makes this unique. So what, how do we make a disordered material that really is, has rigidity of the same kind that we, you might want to, to compare? And so um, I uh, talk about jamming as just one example of how we could get a, uh, a material of this kind. And the idea is really very simple. The idea was you just take a big box, and in this big box you throw in a bunch of particles, and if the particles aren't too many, they can push each other apart, th and they no longer interact with one another. And this thing can flow easily from one side to the other. There's nothing special about um, you know, uh, where the particles are, because they can flow. If you compress this thing too much, this thing clearly becomes overjammed. And so this thing can, the, the particles overlap with one another, and they can no longer move. You can't compress them without paying energy to compress them, and you can't shear them. You, so you have to give, uh, put energy in to do anything, uh, any macroscopic deformations of this system. There's a point in the middle, which is just where these particles are forced to interact with one another. I mean, there's where they just touch, and if you push them any more, then they would start to push back. And so this is the jamming transition. And so this is where uh, uh, what happens at t equals 0. And this is a wonderful material at that jamming transition. It has all sorts of wonderful properties, which I won't talk too much about this evening, but it's this, this is the kind of type of system that could show very disordered material behavior on one side, and then you can tune it back towards where it just becomes rigid at this jamming transition. Okay, so I said I was going to say a little bit about elasticity, and I don't want to say too much, but just the idea of, well, there are, how do we talk about elasticity of a material? Well, you, know, you want to know how it responds. And so one, the one thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of compressing this material. So I compress it on all sides uniformly. And that costs energy to do that, because I'm pushing these particles into one another. And so that's, uh, what that energy is a measure of what's called the bulk modulus of the material. So that's one of the moduli. Another modulus you could do would be, suppose I took this material and I tried to shear it. That would also cost energy. And the energy of shearing would then be uh, tell you what this shear modulus are, is going to be like. So the bulk modulus B and the shear modulus G is what uh, uh, you know, uh, two of the major characteristics of, of any material. And in crystals, what you always find is that the shear modulus G is comparable to the bulk modulus B. And you can kind of see that uh, easily, because if you took two particles and you tried to jam them together, well, they're pushing up against each other, and they're trying to push back, and that's the energy you're paying. That is how much you're pushing one particle into another. And so that's the bulk modulus. But if you were trying to shear it, you would be trying to push one past another, but that's just a, a changing the angle a bit so that you're still pushing one particle into another and still you're still working against that same interparticle potential. And so the shear modulus is going to be kind of the same as the bulk modulus. It should have the same scale. Maybe it's off by a cosine theta, but who cares about a cosine theta? That's, that's the idea of this. And so all crystals are going to have these, this idea that 
the shear and bulk modules are of the same order of magnitude, a you know, factor of you know, a third or something, but, but nothing tremendous. But if you look at a jam system, this ratio, g over b, goes to zero at this transition. And so that's really quite special. That's saying that the shear modulus is, is uh, the, uh, the, uh, I should say, it's infinitely weaker to shear a system than to compress it. And so that's something new. That's something that we didn't have in a crystal. And so this already kind of hints that there's a greater flexibility to to due to disorder. That is, if you didn't have uh, this uh, flexibility, you would have been stuck at one value of g over b. But here, we can tune it all the way from being comparable to being uh, one infinitely weaker than the other. OK, so to make things simple for us tonight, and so this is a, a simplification, is we're going to take these jam systems, and I'm just going to make a network out of them. So they, I start with the jam system. I, I know where all the particle uh, um, spheres are, and at every sphere, I've located center. I replace that with uh, a node, and every place where there's an overlap between two particles, I'd replace that with a spring. And so I start off with this, the black circles, which are the original jam packing, and I replace that then with just this network, which has exactly the same geometry and topology as the um, jam system, and uh, it just has a simplification that I only have the bonds between these nodes to, to worry about, and you know, the elasticity should be quite similar. And so this is a simplification that I'm going to work with this evening. OK, so what do we want to do? Uh, I showed you earlier this uh, you know, rugged energy landscape. And one of the things that we want to do is we want to understand, well, what is the nature of the minima in this landscape? And so we want to you know, explore this landscape. And you can do this in a number of ways. One way is to you know, raise the temperature. And so part of, uh, you, know, you can move from one point to another on this landscape. Or you could shear this thing, as I was just telling you about before. But there's a third way, which is something that we've been studying in this collaboration, which is you can actually go in and microscopically manipulate this system and really exa examine in much more detail what's happening in each of these minima wherever you happen to land. And you do this by going into this network, and you could snip a bond. And ask, OK, so snipping one bond, what does that do to my uh, network, the elastic properties or, or the physical properties of the system after I've done that? So that's the thing that we're going to be trying to uh, understand tonight. So the idea here is I want to look at what I call bond-level response. So bond-level response is I have my whole system, and I measure its bulk modulus, and I measure its shear modulus. I know what that is for the original system. And then I go in at random, and I pick one bond, and I pluck it out. And I measure, OK, what's the new bulk modulus? What's the new shear modulus? And I make a note of that. Then I put that bond back. And then I go in and pick another bond at random, and I do the same thing over and over again. So I can get a find out how each bond in the system changes these, the elastic properties. Well, this would really be quite dull if I had started with a crystal. In the crystal, every time I take a bond out, it changes the moduli. I put it back and I take another bond out. Well, since that every bond is the same in the crystal, it does the same thing, it doesn't matter. That is, it doesn't matter which one I take. So every uh, bond removal will give me exactly the same value of the change in the modulus. Says it's a delta function. That is, it, nothing is, uh, is happening except that I get everything being the same. Okay, so this is rather dull. And so you can ask, well, suppose we started with our uh, jam system and we did that. What would we get? And so here uh, I have a picture of what at least I, when, when we started this, 
what I thought this thing would look like, which would be, okay, it broadens that delta function out, and that some would be a little bit more important for the bulk modulus, some a little bit less, but on average, they would all be about what that bulk modulus is. Well, that's not what uh, nature does. Nature does the following, and so you can see dirty works afoot because this is now a log scale, log scale, so that it's really very, uh, you know, it's showing that I have a vast variation in what this, uh, this behavior is. This is a probability of getting a uh, change in the bulk modulus of a certain amount, delta B, um, or the shear modulus delta G. I plot them both on here because what's one thing is surprising is that it's the same curve. It doesn't matter wh which one it is. Both of these things have the same distribution. The second thing about this, which is very important, is that remember before I just had a basically a delta function with a, uh, a Gaussian around it. Here, this doesn't look like that at all. What it is is a curve that is incredibly broad. It goes all the way down to zero. It has a nice feature that it has this basically power law behavior. We can understand all of these properties, but I'm not interested in explaining those tonight. I just want to say, oh, look, this is really quite different. This is very different from what I would have guessed I would get in a uh, crystalline system. And so um, can we use this in some way? What, what, what can this be good for? And so their distributions are broad continuous and universal. And one other thing that is, was really the major surprise here is I would have thought that if I had a material that had a distribution of contributions of a bond to something, if I take out a bond and it was really, really important for, let's say, the bulk modulus, that bond would also be important for the shear modulus. I mean, if a bond is important, it's important, right? It, it plays an important role. What this curve is also showing, because there are many data points hidden in that line, is it doesn't matter which, uh, I mean, the, these two things are totally uncorrelated. That is, if you took a bond here that was very, very important for the bulk modulus and asked what did that bond do for the shear modulus, it's equally likely to have come from any place in this whole curve. So we have an uncorrelation of these two contributions. Yeah. So the, the, it doesn't really matter. That is, uh, as we're above the jamming transition. That is, we have to be above it. The shear modulus, but uh, what I care about there is the shear modulus divided by, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm looking the relative average to the bulk modulus and to the shear modulus. So I've divided this so that this all would sit on top of each other. Otherwise, you're right, this thing would just shift down. But in so the, uh, is, uh, the theoretical line is a, uh, understood afterwards. We, uh, we got the data first, and we understood the, the data, and we got better and better data, and so that's what we got. And then we said, where does this come from? And this was an understanding that was uh, provided by uh, postdoc uh, Daniel Hexner. So he was able to uh, you know, uh, analyze this and see why this should be the case. Uh, so I get to do that because I'm on a computer and I get to go in and snip that bond. So this is from a computer point of view. It's a very good question because that's what the second or the third half of this talk is going to be about. How could I do this and make it work? Right? I mean, uh, and so, uh, uh, so, so if you hold on to that question, I hope I'll, I'll try to give you some flavor of why, uh, wh why we can do this. OK, so uh, this is what I call this new principle of disordered matter, this independence of bond level response. So the contribution of any bond to one modulus is uncorrelated to its contribution to another. And so that's this surprising thing that, it, you know, a bond, no one bond is more important than another. In general, it will just play different roles depending on what perturbation I'm putting on the outside, what kind of compression or shear I'm putting on. Um, and the other part is what I showed you at the beginning, is that these distributions are very broad and universal. And so this is, uh, you know, and, and there, there's, if you notice, there was a star on that, that there was some thing I swept under the rug, but basically they're uh, universal, okay? 
So this is a new principle for disordered matter, and this is um, you know, one of the things that comes out of trying to study what is the physics of disorder as distinct from what you would have gotten for an ordered system. So they're really very, very different. This is not the same. So uh, we, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so it doesn't matter very much for what I'm talking about now. We haven't studied uh, it over enormous ranges of particle size, but uh, certainly uh, uh, in a two-dimensional system, I don't want to have all the particles be the same size because then they tend to crystallize, and so I don't want to do that. So I'm always dealing with bidispersed or polydispersed things in two dimensions. In three dimensions, it, uh, that's much less onerous, and so I could get by with monodispersed or a polydispersed system. I, I'm not letting some particles go to zero, but uh, size, but you know, plus or minus 30 percent. Uh, we, we've done that, and it doesn't matter for the principle I'm talking about tonight. Doesn't matter. Good question. Let's see. Okay. So let's. Uh, um, okay. So. Now I want to talk about this idea of malleability of disorder. And so uh, what are the new design rules that you can use? And so this is exactly where I want to go with doing, doing just what you're telling me. OK, so remember this diagram I had at the beginning. So this is uh, the bulk modulus and the shear modulus. And uh, the bulk modulus measures the compression. The shear modulus measures the shear. And um, the Poisson's ratio uh, is uh, telling me um, how to compress one. Uh, you know, there's if I uh, well, I'll just show you. Uh, so the Poisson's uh, ratio is the following. That is, if I take a material and I pull it in one direction, it gets narrower in the other two dimensions. Right? That's a typical Poisson ratio material. That is. Basically, the volume hasn't changed too much. It's more or less incompressible. That is, I can I pull it, and the volume remains the same. Okay, so that's a typical material. Uh, but you could have thought of another kind of material, which would have been made of something like these, where I pull it in one direction, and it expands in all directions, right? And so that's a, a weird material. If if I had a material that behaved like this, and this is what's called a negative Poisson ratio material. And so this is looking at you know, the compression or, or the, the change in these, in these two directions when I pull it in or compress it in along this one axis. Okay? And so that's what the Poisson ratio measures. And, um, uh, and so uh, what I want to now uh, just point out is that this ratio that I've been telling you about, the bulk modulus and the shear modulus, if I take the ratio of G over B, that is the same information as what you get in the Poisson's ratio. That is, it's uh, just ordinary elasticity theory tells me that the Poisson's ratio, that is how much it compresses along the uh, side axis when I pull on in, in the uh, longitudinal direction, versus G over B, it's a monotonic function, one is a monotonic function of the other. If G is much, much smaller than B, then you have a normal material. That is what we're all used to. If G is much, much bigger than B, then <coughs> you get this negative Poisson's ratio ma material, and this is weird. So does anyone know what's the common thing that you actually have that has a Poisson ratio near zero? Cork. Uh, your wine bottles are made, uh, you know, stuffed with cork, and it's good that they found a material to do that with. Because if you had an ordinary material, and I tried to force this uh, this material into the wine bottle, it would just explode the wine bottle, right? And so cork is very nice because you can push it in or pull it out without this thing breaking or flying out of the of the material. And so, you know, we don't have very many negative Poisson ratio materials. And you can just begin to think that there are so many different things. It would be great if we had them, and you could begin to, um, to use this as a, as a new kind of building block for, for matter. So what does this have to do with what I was telling you about? And so this is your question that you just asked uh, a minute ago. So 
what, now that I know that I care about this ratio of G over B, and I can manipulate G and B independently of one another, then I can start doing the following. So if I start at some number of bonds that are large over, you know, where this thing is con uh, over constrained system, so it's a highly jammed system, I can choose, since I know everything from the computer, I can choose which bond has the uh, largest change in delta B. If I pull that out, B gets dropped as much as possible. G only gets dropped by its average amount. And so G over B should go up. And so that was one bond. So I do it again and again and again. So this is your question, doing it over and over again. Where do I end up? And note that this is, again, a log scale. And by doing this a whole bunch of times, we can get something 10 to the 12 times larger ratio of G over B than where we started with. Okay, so that was by going into the computer, knowing what we wanted to do, and choosing the right bond to pull out, and we were able to then manipulate it. And I can get as auxetic a material as I want. I mean, this is uh, G over B goes to infinity is, means it's essentially negative one for the Poisson's ratio. It's, it's, it's this thing. But I could have done any of the other algorithms as well. That is, I could have uh, pruned the bonds with the minimum delta B, and I would have gotten this green line, because now uh, the minimum delta B doesn't change B at all, but it drops uh, G by its the most it can, and so it's going to tr get smaller. And I could do the same things by tr triggering on the value of G that it has. So I can get anything I want from 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the 12. I mean, so this is, you know, many orders of magnitude that, that we're able to do just by plucking out a few of the bonds in any material that I have. Okay, and so this is what I would say a greedy computer algorithm. Each time I went in and I chose, okay, which bond is going to be the most bang for the buck? That is, I pull this bond out and I pull out a, a one with the largest delta B, and then I keep doing that, and I just flow along this curve. And they're basically power law curves that I can go as, as high as I want. Okay, and so that was a greedy algorithm that we got from the computer. It didn't think ahead. It didn't have to do any computation of any great merit. All it did was find, okay, which local move could I do which is the best? And that's all it did. And we were able to get this vast array of, of things that we could do. So that is what we would get for uh, this bulk property. And that's neat because you know I've already shown now that we can make these materials that are weird materials, things you wouldn't normally get. But we want to know, could you do something else? And so this is an idea that we get from the protein literature. And so in proteins, there's this thing that they call allosteri, which I didn't know what it meant until we ran into it. Uh, and what allosteri is, is that if you have a protein of some large molecule, and I do something here, at a far distant point, the protein now behaves differently than it did before. That is, it could open up a bit, so it now can bind something that was there, or it could close it up so it couldn't bind anymore. And so it, that is, I do a local thing at one point, and far away, there's an action. And this is important for biological activity in proteins. And so we were wondering, well, is this something that we could design into a network as well? Or is this something really special about the protein molecules, or is it something m more generic? And so this is work that uh, several groups in, in our collaboration were working on. So our group and also uh, uh, Carolina, who's here, and uh, Mathieu were working on the same types of things. And the idea is that you know, we take a random network that we've, you know, we just take any one that we pull out of the computer, and I come up and ask you, please, Choose some point on this that you want to be the source. And so you come in and you just choose, okay, this point is the source. I mean, I can't do this now because I'm talking, but I mean, uh, but we could have done this before and we've 
you, you have complete choice to where the source should be. Then I call you back and say, okay, I want you also to choose the target. And so you choose that point up there as a target. It's far away. And then I ask the following question is, well, okay, you get this one last choice is, if I pull on the source, do I want the target to come apart or do I want to go together? So I'm giving you complete choice as to what you want this thing to have, what it, whatever you want it to do. And so it chooses this. And so uh, what I want to show you is that um, we can do this. And so uh, this is now... Uh, something that uh, we're able to make in the lab. And so uh, can we, yeah, here. So, uh, so this is what, what's here. So you can see my finger. That's, so you see that's, that's live. OK, and so uh, it's, uh, here's this uh, network. And you know, I asked you to, wh where is the, uh, the source? And uh, we chose these two points to be the source. And then, where did you want to be the target? Here and here. Okay, so that was what the uh, what we tried to do. And then, now I want to show you what what can be done with this. So this is actually not one network, although I put them on top of each other, just so you can see that yes, they really, really look almost identical to to each other. But there are a few bonds that are different. Just a, about four bonds that are different between these two networks. And now I pull one apart. And I take this source here, you can see it, and I pull it apart, and you can see that moves together. And I take this one, and I pull this one apart, and it moves apart. That is, I can design any of this I want, and so here is in, in your face obvious that we could have chosen either one, and we can do this with essentially 100% uh, success rate uh, over and over again. We can do it in three dimensions as well. So uh, that's a three-dimensional uh, one. And uh, you know, you, we have, this was the uh, source in white, and uh, this red was, in, was the target. And you know, if I squeeze this, you probably can't see in the back, but you can see that, that we can design this in three dimensions as well. So we can not only design it, we can build them. So these are things that are eminently uh, doable in our uh, in the lab. Uh, uh, one and then, uh, uh, okay, you, 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 you ask, so you, you first. So the question is, um, how much is this uh, dependent on the network topology? Can I do this way with only two networks? Or if I have two clusters and there's one guy connecting with uh, So look, th 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 those are wonderful questions, and I don't know the answer to the generality of this. That is, uh, this is why I told you specifically that I started with the jammed network, because uh, That's right. But I don't think it has to be jammed. I think it's, it's much more general than that. But I'm sure you can find networks that will violate this as well. But certainly all the jam networks do this. Any things that are, look like jam networks seem to be OK. <coughs> but there are going to be others that are. It sounds uh, like there's a correlation issue to this. And, and so, so th that would be something that, that we should yeah. look at. So. Uh, So the algorithm is that basically we, uh, uh, it's again, is greedy algorithm. We have a cost function that we say how much the, uh, uh, you know, uh, how, you know, if we do this, we want this thing to behave in a certain way. So we make that a cost function. And then we go through and ask which bond got me closest to or lowered the cost by as much as possible. So that that's kind of what the algorithm is. It's very similar to what we did with the other one. And what it scales like is, uh, not entirely sure, but it looks kind of like it's linear in the dimension of the system, not as, as uh, so, so as you go to larger and larger systems, you have to take out the fewer and fewer percentage of the bonds. No, uh, that is, they can be anywhere that is, uh, this, we, th these are in uh, finite size systems. We can do this also with a uh, totally uh, periodically continued systems. Uh, I, I can't make them periodically continued because that's a, I don't know how to do that, but on the computer we can. How many sources and targets can you put in the target? 
So um, this is a great question, and so uh, we, we've studied one aspect of that. That is, we've studied, if we start with one source, how many targets can I control? And you can control a lot. I didn't put in that slide here because that's not the... I'm, I'm trying to move on to the next thing, but we can, and so it's a sat unsat problem in, in the sense that is you get 100% possibility out to some large n, and then suddenly it drops off where I can't solve it anymore. And so that's what it looks like, and then the, how many increases with the size of the system, and so, uh, so, uh, but it says that I can d d solve this in, you know, and factorial ways. I mean, there's lots and lots, depending on how many other sources I uh, want to have. Someone is. I think it's kind of loaded to do, but I'm trying to imagine what a material would look like which is as G over B very high, and uh, there is like a naturally occurring material like that. Mm. Um, well, uh, so. Uh, no, naturally occurring materials, or if they did have that, they'd be auxetic. They'd be negative Poisson ratio. And I already told you those were weird. Mm -hmm. So this means that I have to, uh, th these uh, things that I'm making are not naturally occurring, but I've made them to be that way. And yes, they will have a large, I mean, it's one to one correspondence. If I have a large negative Poisson ratio, it means G is much bigger than B. Okay. Uh, so, look, uh, I mean, th there's all sorts of wonderful questions about this. I'm not going to, I, I guess I don't want to go off into that pathway right now. But yes, there is, uh, you know, one uh, class of work that uh, Andrea Liu's group is doing now is trying to understand, well, what is the nature of the topology of looking at, you know, is there a crease, is there a fold, is there a break between these things? But w what I would also say is that it's not going to be only one kind. That is, you have a very broad distribution of what can happen. Because uh, as I showed you, I can do this in many, 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 many different ways. Right? And so I can find ones that are very much like a uh, uh, one path, others which are much more distributed. OK, so um, now I just want to uh, say, uh, whoops, I went back to this. So uh, uh, to where was I? I just showed you, okay, so now the directed, so this is the last half of the talk, okay? And so this is uh, this idea of directed aging. And so I want to say a word or two about aging. Um, <coughs> and so typically, aging is considered to be a nuisance, right? And it, it makes, uh, it's m merely detrimental to anything that we want. But, uh, and as an example of that, I don't know how many of you uh, when you were in high school or grade school, you know, you had your ruler and, you know, you were <laughs> measuring something at school and you got uh, one result. And then when you went home, you, ha you remeasured it and you seemed to get a different answer. And then why was that? And, well, the reason for that is, well, uh, you use different rulers. And so I don't know whether you can see this. There's one of these rulers has been, this one has been aged and the other one not, and they're, and they're of different length, right? One has shrunk over time with respect to the other. And so that's why when you went home and you used the old ruler that you had bought long ago, you were getting slightly different answers. So this is an example of aging being detrimental and a pain, right? And uh, <laughs> well, uh, uh, I think that they have improved the plastics since I was a kid. <laughs> and so uh, th this is, uh, I have to admit, this is age. This is completely age. But I aged it, uh, accelerated the aging. Uh, uh, by uh, I used heat to uh, accelerate the aging. You know, so that's, th but this is the effect that, that you saw back in high school, at, at least at my age. Uh, well, this was not microwave. Microwave wouldn't have done much to, to plastic, but uh, uh, um, but boiling water would, would do it. Okay, uh, so okay, so so that's an idea of what aging is and what you're familiar with. So, okay, can uh, can we go to the yeah? So, 
but I want you to consider another possibility. And so consider an enormous pile of, of something. So sand, salt, gravel, something, you know, very, very large and made of grains. And I'm going to look deep inside this pile. And in this region, the material is under incredible stresses from all the weight on top of it. And so the pressure is enormous. So now I want to look, well, what would that mean? So if I look at one point on the pile, I see a place where two of these grains are really pushing up to each, uh, onto each other with a great deal of force. Another place, just a little, uh, or another direction, they're hardly touching at all. Slightly, but not much. And then you ask, okay, so what's going to happen that these, over time, these two kinds of contacts will behave differently from one another? because one is under pressure and one is not. And so if you think about the ones that are under great stress are going to deform slowly under time, that is, they, uh, they'll deform plastically because they under, they're feeling this pressure, and those under no stress basically remain unaffected over time, then you see that there's preferential relaxation of the bonds that are under stress. Those that are under stress are going to plastically deform, those that are not under stress are going to remain basically unaffected. So over time, this is just similar to what I've been describing about the pruning algorithm. I preferentially pruned those bonds which would feel the most pressure on them. Right? And here, I'm saying, oh, but nature is doing that for me. <coughs> and so the system is going to evolve depending on the stresses to which it was exposed. And now I want to ask, does such a system naturally become auxetic, that is, naturally have a negative Poisson ratio? And so to th consider this, I just want to look to start off with at uh, the evolution of such a system, so of a network. And so the energy of that network that I wrote down for you at the beginning is just the sum of the springs being stretched on each bond. And so that's the total energy is 1 half k delta x squared for each bond, summed overall. That's the total energy. And then you could ask, well, what does plastic deformation do? Well, it slowly could change the spring constant of where these particles are pushing up against each other. Or it could slowly change the length of the spring if the, if the material flows out of that region and they could get a little bit closer together. So there are various possibilities for what the system, how it could respond, but the point is that it will respond. It will respond in a way that remembers what its training was, how it was aged, and I didn't need any computer to optimize the response, and I don't need the tiny finger. Someone here asked, how could I do this in, in, in a real uh, system, because the real system, how could I look down so carefully and pull out one bond at a time at a microscopic scale? So here. I'm not having to do that. I'm trying to let nature do that evolution for me. And so here is a simulation uh, of looking at one of those networks that we treat it in this way. We compress it, and we let this thing age. And you see that over time, this thing starts with a nice positive Poisson ratio and drops to uh, significantly negative values. And so this thing has become really auxetic by the end of this aging process. Okay, so this is one example. Um, another thing you could have asked is, well, could I have taught this thing to be allosteric as well? That is, the, the one having to do with the local uh, bond changing at one point versus another. And that's what uh, we're showing here. So we started with this network, and this answers the question about whether it had to be at the external edge or it could be inside. So here was the source, this green one. This was the target. And so what Daniel did here was he just uh, did this uh, an oscillating shear to this thing. And this is what the response is. And so the green is the, um, the source. And so it's just constantly being the same amount each time, back and forth, back and forth, over and over again. So this is 25 cycles. And the red is what this target is responding. And you see that 
At the beginning, it doesn't respond at all, but after a while, the response picks up, and towards the end, it's already uh, over 80% of what the uh, source is doing. So it's able to even do the allosteric behavior, not just the Poisson ratio. Well, uh, that's you, you're tru tuning that in by you're, you're playing with both of these bonds at the same time. So if you wanted the other, you would uh, do, do them out of phase with each other. So, so it's not th that randomness isn't there. OK, so can we do this in the real world? And so this is uh, what we've done. So we can now take materials which I did not accelerate the aging as I did with the rulers because the rulers, I had to buy the right material that they make rulers from. But here, we've used a uh, EVA foam to make our systems. We can make all sorts of systems, as we can make ones that look like uh, particle packings. And so that's the one on the left. In the middle is the one with the, uh, what I've been describing all along, which are ones based on these networks coming from the particle packings. On the right, we have the negative of this, that is, we have holes punched into this uh, sheet um, that uh, is, comes from, uh, uh, you know, so this is a holy sheet in that uh, you, you put the holes in uh, at random as they would have been from the jam packing, but um, now they're holes rather than particles. And then what we do is we do the aging, just as I told you we were thinking about doing it in the simulations. Here we're doing it in real life. So what Nitty does is she takes this and she sticks that material into a frame that's somewhat smaller and then just waits. Does nothing more than just wait. So it sits there for a day. And at the end of the day, I mean, so that's why it's important to have chosen the right material because this is one that you can do in a day. I mean, other materials might take years to to get the plastic to flow, but this is a nice one that we can do these experiments on and see how it works. And so she sticks them in here for some waiting period, and then she removes this and now measures the new Poisson ratio for this material. And so this is the results for that. That is, if depending on how much she's, the training strain is that you can either have a small effect or if you increase the strain, you can certainly train this thing now, this is a real system, that this real system has become negative uh, Poisson ratio, and uh, that you can tune this Poisson ratio to be, uh, uh, you know, depending on the strain, you can get it to be uh, you know, negative in, in all of these. Uh, well, in, in, in these two, it can goes negative. In the first one, it certainly drops, but it doesn't get to the negative regime. So we can do this in the lab as well. OK, so I, uh, uh, yes, I mean, I could have done this by uh, uh, then tuning on the shear modules rather than the bulk modules. Right, and, and so I would, uh, but, but yes, I mean, I can tune pretty much what I want. OK, so the last thing, uh, since I'm running out of time, I'm just going to very quickly uh, just uh, say that uh, we can do this in other uh, protocols as well. Th so I've been talking about these uh, uh, these networks, but remember this guy. And um, this guy uh, was able, I did this by shearing back and forth. I can do that in a jam system, and so I take this jam system, uh, and um, so this is uh, starting with what uh, Sri Shastri has shown is that you start with this jam system, and now you do the same kind of oscillating shear on this thing. And after a while, it then drops into a state where it remembers what that shear stress was, the maximum shear stress you put on this is. And so you can see that how rapidly that happens. In this system, it took only four cycles before this thing then found out of all of the possible ground states for the system. I mean, I m mind you, that is, there are a few thousand particles in the system. The number of ground states is on the order of 10 to the 1,000. And it, of all those ground states, it finds one that it just goes around this path, visiting the same few minimum over and over and over again as I go through the cycle. 
And so uh, the end point of this is just to say, well, you know, it was very easy in these systems that are based on these jamming configurations on, uh, on the very rough energy landscape picture to tune in memories of what you started, and it, you can tune them in different ways, and you can get different behaviors which may be what you want to tune in. And, and it's now depends on us what you want to tune in and what our imagination tells us is what we can tune in. The point is it's exceedingly easy to do this in all of the cases that I've shown you, both the shearing, which only takes a few oscillations, and these uh, networks, which uh, uh, can break apart. Uh, uh, you know, that, that the, the networks where I only have to take a few bonds out before it reaches its end point. And so let me just um, finish uh, with this. I'll go back to that quote I had at the beginning, that there are as many forms of memory as there are ways of perceiving, and every one of them is worth mining for inspiration. And so I think, you know, I've only shown you a couple of memories here, and each one of them then, uh, you know, you can use that, and using that memory we can get to an endpoint that actually could possibly be useful for us. And not only can we do this, we can do, do this easily, and we're just limited by our imagination. There's how, what, what could we conceive of that we want to build, that we could build in this new way, because we have the new laws of disorder that we're able to then uh, harness for our uh, use. And so, you know, there, uh, I come back to this idea of, so we have the memory, we have this directed aging, is the aging is directed to a final outcome that we want. And the final thing is this idea of a greedy minimum, a gr greedy algorithm. That is, before we were using a computer's greedy algorithm to find where we want to go. But now, in the laboratory, we're not using the computer anymore. We're letting nature follow its own greedy algorithm, which is it, it always wants to go downhill. It wants to plastically deform to relieve whatever stresses it's under. This is nature's form of a greedy algorithm, and using those together, we're able to uh, get many of these uh, results that we're interested in. Okay, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>